Now that we've seen rookie seasons, with the benefit of a little bit of hindsight, how do we feel about that Jordan Addison pick? Let's dive into it on the Locked On Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What's up? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, where we're always trying to learn something new. It's part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you to those of you who listen to this show every single day. My hashtag everydayers. I appreciate y'all so very much, especially those of you that come around, hang out in the off season. I wonder... (laughs) I wonder if we're going to see some people come back now that there aren't any NFC North teams in the playoffs anymore. Lions lost in the NFC championship. And I do feel like people like just needed to step away from football because some of y'all just could not handle there being a rival in the NFC championship game. Uh, And you know what? It's between you and you and your mirror. (laughs) Anyways, you can find this show wherever you find your favorite podcasts, whether it is an audio listening place like Sirius XM or even on uh, YouTube or Amazon Fire and Roku. Today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL, all lowercase, for a first deposit match up to $100. So we're getting closer to the end of the actual, like the Super Bowl and, and like the true blue offseason, where there are a couple of things that are going to take a long time to get through that I want to get that I want to talk about. I want to keep doing these kind of free agency previews things. Uh, I want to do an interior defensive line one. If you're interested in like free agent targets and stuff, I've already done edge rushers and corners. If you're interested in that, there's previous episodes. You can pause this one and and go listen to those if you want. And I'll probably do like D line, uh, maybe like a linebacker thing. Talk about the guard market. Should we bring back Reisner's or somebody else? Um, so there's, there's stuff like that. I want to do those shows. Um, I want to eventually, and I think sooner than later, get into the draft quarterbacks on this show. I haven't talked about them at all, but I've done extensive, uh, I've already made like a ton of content on four of them on Drake May, Jaden Daniels, Caleb Williams, and Michael Penix. Uh, if you're interested in those, you can find them at patreon.com slash Luke Brown NFL. And then what I'm going to embark on today, which is sort of a retrospective on the 2023 draft picks. I am of the mind that, you know, by year three with a draft pick, like in year three, you know, I think Justin Fields is a great example, right? He was a lot of potential. There was a lot of maybe a lot of question mark. And now Caleb Williams is like the overwhelming favorite to go first overall. <laughs> and, and a lot of the the like bears uh, rumor mill and like they're interviewing Greg Roman and stuff. And you think oh, they're, they're like kind of setting up for Caleb. Uh, they could still keep Justin Fields. I honestly wouldn't be like super surprised by that. But like the, the conversation is not around extending Justin Fields. We're not talking about the contract he's going to get right. Like even Daniel Jones made it that far. By year three, you know, uh, anybody drafted in 2020, like Christian Derrissaw, we know how good of a pick that was. Wyatt Davis, we also know how good of a pick that was. <laughs> so I think it's a little early to really have this conversation. But hey, it's the offseason and we we can't we won't make any sweeping declarations and, and, you know, go too deep into like he was definitely a terrible or a great pick for sure. Like a lot can change over the course of a year or two guys are developing, right? That said, I think we can at least get a vibe. We can say, I'm feeling okay about it, right? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling bad. But understand that it's still like an in-progress thing. It's it's, it's a game in the second quarter, right? And hey, if you have a 17-point lead in the second quarter, anything can happen. So with all that in mind, how do we feel about Jordan Addison? I'll give you the statistical thing first. So he gets uh, 911 total yards on 70 catches, 104 targets, um, 10 touchdowns. Led the team in touchdowns, if I'm not mistaken. Yards per route run, 1.5 on the nose, uh, which lands about middle of the league in terms of that efficiency stat, which is my favorite wide receiver stat. That's about the statistical profile. Uh, It's very a mid statistical profile. He's a wide receiver too, right? You're going to be in a world with Hawkinson and and Justin Jefferson. um, Very much took that, that wide receiver two slot from KJ Osborne. If you go back to like our preview stuff, from Locked On Vikings, or if you go listen to any of the fantasy stuff that I got, I, I did a lot of fantasy shows around like May and and uh, especially around like July and August when people are doing their drafts. Every all the fantasy shows will call up 
And they would always ask me, what about Jordan Addison? And I say, you're kind of picking him or KJ Osborne to win that job. And someone's going to get the volume and someone's going to fall away. Addison won the job. Osborne fell away. That's the result that we're looking at. Um, and KJ Osborne now pending free agent. I don't really see him back, although I think it's small enough potatoes where uh, I, I wouldn't really be shocked. I because like I guess like sure, but it wouldn't do a lot for me. So Jordan Addison is firmly wide receiver too, and so statistically, like if you're listening to this from a fantasy perspective or or like a betting perspective where you're just trying to project production, he's gonna be capped. Forever, for as long as Justin Jefferson's on the same team as him. he's It's just, just going to be a cap to how much market share is his. So so the statistical output is just going to be, and, and the efficiency is going to be, um, there's just going to be a lot of routes where he does well or poorly or whatever, and it doesn't matter because Justin Jefferson is on the team and he got the target because he's the first read all the time. Uh, and that's fine. That The Vikings knew that going in. I think if you wanted to, you could try to make the argument about, well, if they're, the guy's only ever going to be a wide receiver too, is that worth a first round pick? Personally, slam dunk, absolutely. I think it was one of the major problems with the Vikings was not having enough downfield receiving threats. That was one of their major problems in 2022. Halfway through 2022, they brought in TJ Hawkinson, but like, of course, he's only going to be so, there's only going to be so much equity to a guy you get in the middle of the season. So you already didn't get eight or nine games with him. And then he's like, you know, ramping up. So getting another serious receiving option definitely was a, a, a draft. And, and like we went into the draft and it was like corner or receiver and anything else, I would have been pretty surprised. Um, so, yeah, if you wanted to make that positional value thing, I think you could try to make that argument, but I don't think it would be a very good one. Um, but the statistical argument is, yeah, it's uh, the production itself is always going to be a little mid. He's I don't think he's going to be a guy that goes in the first round of anyone's fantasy draft. Unless, you know, it's it's a season where Jordan or where Justin Jefferson is hurt, you know, all season long. Like he is hurt in camp or something before you had your fantasy draft. And now Addison's going to be wide receiver one. And as wide receiver one, it was a little bit hit and miss. Uh, if you look like average, he got 53 yards a game on average, which a 50 yard game for a wide receiver two is perfectly respectable. That's a fine game. Um, but I, here's the interesting question, I guess, from a statistical angle. Would you rather have the guy that gets 50, like if you're going to have a 900 yard receiver, would you rather have the guy that gets 53 every week, steady Eddie, you know, very reliable, always there, gives you a little, or would you rather have the guy that has a couple disappearing acts, but can also pop off for like a buck 40 and two touchdowns because <laughs> he had like multiple hundred yard games um, and he was a bit of a touchdown machine and these were not Mickey Mouse touchdowns. There were a couple that were, you know. Uh, you know, one yard goal line plays. But I mean, these were deep posts, bombs, explosive plays. And I think that's a really, really important thing to understand about his statistical profile. If you are a dynasty fantasy player trying to figure out if you're like trading for Jordan Addison, you have to understand that he was a weak winner sometimes. And then sometimes he would put up nothing. And, you know, that makes him the kind of player that you, you put in your lineup when you're like a huge underdog or something and you need a little bit of luck. Uh, but not necessarily if you're trying to avoid that risk. Like he was a, he was a risky week to week proposition. Why that happened, you have to look beyond the statistical profile to really get an understanding for, for why that happened and the nuance to it. Um, but it also isn't so bad a thing because I think, you know, fantasy players might like that boomer bus player a little better. And I think teams might like that boomer bus player a little bit better. Like, the Vikings don't beat San Francisco without Jordan Addison. They didn't have JJ in that game. Uh, and without Jordan Addison and the, the hero ball that Addison played, there's no way that the Vikings find a way to move the ball nearly as much. I mean, like Brandon Powell's not doing that, right? Uh, and sure enough, that's the NFC champion. One team in the NFC North beat San Francisco. Got him. <laughs> Someone make up a banner. Let's hang it, baby. Let's, let's beat San Francisco in 2023. And they broke the Kirk Cousins curse, by the way. I'm getting totally off topic, though. So, okay. Stats, people, that's that's the statistical profile. I think you can go over it pretty fast. It's not a, a particularly robust thing to go over the statistical profile of a wide receiver. So if that's all you were here for, for that or for fantasy or whatever, that's that. But for everybody who's a little bit more curious, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep going. All right? Okay. Today's episode of Lockdown Vikings is brought to you by Prize 
picks. It's Daily Fantasy made easy, and it's my favorite way to play Daily Fantasy. I can't stand standard Daily Fantasy. The make a whole lineup, enter a huge pool. It's just like deeply unfun to me, but prize picks to me was an absolute blast. Played it every Friday here on Locked On Vikings, did great. Um, I mi- I got lazy and missed it for the championship games, but I'm still playing it. Like I'm not even making content anymore, but I'm still having a great time on uh, the prize picks for the, the, the playoffs. So every Friday, they actually have uh, flex Fridays. So here's the format of prize picks. You pick two to six of your favorite players and whether or not they'll do better or worse than their prize picks projection. So it's just you versus prize picks setting the numbers. And prize picks is not particularly fantastic at setting the numbers. I think that it is exploitable. And I kind of have proven that because I'm like, I've, I'm up 100% now on the year. You can get involved at prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for first deposit match up to $100. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL, code locked on NFL for first deposit match up to $100. Thank you so much for making Locked On Vikings your first listen of the day each and every day. If you are a YouTube watcher, hello, hi, uh, great to see you. Don't touch a button. Don't touch a dial at all. This will take you directly to a 24-7 live stream of Locked On Minnesota Sports. All Minnesota Sports talk all day long. Flick that thing on in the background and forget about it. It's on the Locked On Minnesota Sports YouTube page if you need to navigate to it yourself. Uh, Highly recommend for some background watching while you work or whatever. So let's move on here. That was the statistical profile of Jordan Addison. And I think if you said he was a boomer bust player, he's explosive but inconsistent. I think that's like a, those are good adjectives, I think, to describe Jordan Addison's season. But it doesn't really drive at A, like, are we happy with the pick? Um, and just the nature of explosiveness and volatility in a receiver. What makes a receiver the kind of guy that can pop off for 120 and two touchdowns and then totally disappear the next week, right? Is he good or isn't he? The the statistics can't tell you that. They can't explain that. And so we have to look a little bit deeper. Um, You know, you can get better predictive efficiency and stuff like that, but you never get the why. Uh, And so I guess there's, there's kind of two facets to this. One is against draft position and and against the other guys that were around. How do, how do we feel about it? Right. And it's really difficult to do that without getting really hindsighty, because if you look at that wide receiver board and where people were on that wide receiver board, there was kind of a big four and they all went in the same run and the Vikings picked last of that run. So they kind of got the guy that they got. So it's sort of this like moot point. It's like the, the actual alternatives to Jordan Addison, the people that most everybody agreed were kind of in the same tier as him. He was the last of that group before a huge cliff. So if you were going to take a, a, a wide receiver, you were taking Addison or you were like waiting and hoping that you hit the right guy on day three. Right. And it's just as easy to find the Puka Nakua as it is to find, you know, Joe Schmo who's out of the league in two years in the fifth round. Right. Like that. There's plenty of Dylan Mitchell's out there too. Um, so I, it doesn't bug me too much. And I think the only, like, I, if, if I were a Seahawks fan, I were looking at Smith and Jigba, I'd be pretty happy with it. I'd be fine with it. I mean, Raiders are, or Ravens fans are clearly ecstatic. Maybe not today, uh, but they're clearly ecstatic with the, the Flowers pick, at least. And um, Chargers fans are probably apoplectic. Like, that's pretty easy to, to determine. And then the Vikings, like, also got their guy and it worked out great. Um that explosiveness really, really, really helped when Justin Jefferson was on the field. And I mean, without Justin Jefferson on the field, we really saw Addison get tested to go be that guy, go be that number one. And I remember from the story time series doing that in the summer and, and talking to uh, locked on Trojans, Mark Culkin, um, that, that that's always the guy that he wanted to be was the guy that that steps up and is the hero and is the playmaker. Right. I mean, his Twitter handle is ESPN Jordan. And I I love that detail about him because I think it really encapsulates a lot of his mentality and his attitude that he wants to be the playmaker. Like there's very like that that 49ers game, that Charvarius Ward sequence where he kind of gets like dogged for an interception, then dogs him back um, is so quintessential to what I understand his character to be where he is just a freaking fighter. Like, that's what I get from Jordan Addison. And so when he had to step up and be wide receiver one, mentally, he was very, very, very ready to do that. There were times when he did not succeed there. <laughs> so why that is becomes 
the next question. But I, I guess to the sense of are we happy with the pick? Yeah, I, I think you got everything you thought you were getting out of Jordan Addison. And and the weaknesses that we have we understand for Jordan Addison, which is like, you know, he's smaller. Um and that size can can lead to like some disappearing acts and stuff. Like the weaknesses we understand for him, um, you knew that going in, right? So you kind of already decided to buy that. And so if you're like, yeah, you know, first round receiver, but he was too small. That is a, a perfectly valid disagreement with the Vikings. But you have to understand that that's already going to be worked into their expectations. So when it comes to actually decision making things like, should we draft a receiver in the first round? Right? Well, look, if it's, if it's, you know, 2017 and the Vikings didn't have a first round pick that year, but say they did. And, you know, Laquan Treadwell's a second year player and we're headed into the draft. I would guess that wide receiver would have been a little bit more on the table than it is now. But, but for the Vikings, they've got one and they've got two in the building. If you want to draft number three, you can, but it's probably less of a first round guy, right? If we already are trying to figure out like where the market share is going to go for Addison and Hawkinson while we still have to give so much market share to jo to Justin Jefferson. I keep trying to say Jordan Jefferson. Uh, <laughs> so I apologize. Like it's really difficult to justify large spending of resources on somebody who's only got like so much of the pie left to come uh, left to left to eat out of. So it gets like really hard to justify the amount of resources it would take to get like a really good, like a first round receiver or spend a bunch in free agency on a receiver. You can get wide receiver three, right? Get a complimentary piece to kind of replace uh, KJ Osborne. But those start to look more like depth signings than actual like real premier. You know, we went out and splurged kind of stuff. Um, and, and that's what you wanted from a first round pick was, was to accomplish that. Right. Ultimately, Jordan Addison was here to solve a problem. And, and it wasn't a, he's here to solve a roster hole, because what do you usually spend on wide receiver two is too blanket a question, because not all wide receiver twos are, are, are the same, not all offenses are the same, and not all situations are the same. So to compare what someone else spent on their wide receiver two is different than, because they don't have a Justin Jefferson, right? We have a very unique situation in that we have Justin Jefferson in particular, who has, uh, is, is, you know, gathering a certain amount, a certain kind of defense and who has a certain role in the offense and he has a certain rapport with, with, with Kirk Cousins and, and the way that Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson connect happens, you know, really well on like this route and that route. And so how do you, you know, work those into concepts and who runs the other routes on those concepts? The answer to that question for the Vikings will be a lot different than the answer to that question for Zay Jamar Chase and, and the Bengals. And, and it's not, you know, one is worse or better or whatever. It's just different. It's a different shape of things. And so Addison was here to solve a problem. And, and, and that problem was to punish two high safeties. When you had two safeties high, and that meant you could get one, you could, you could bracket Jefferson all day. 2022 team struggled with that. He is here to punish that. He's here to be fast, take the top off the defense, and say, if that safety is going to bracket Justin Jefferson, we're running a post and we're getting a touchdown on you. And they did. Got a bunch of touchdowns on it. Like, I, I don't think you can look at that situation and say, that that didn't solve the problem it was meant to solve. And you actually got a couple of good games when Jefferson was out, which I don't think was really the idea. Uh, I, I think it was really, he's here to solve the like main problem in the passing offense. And he did. Uh, so so I, I'm thrilled with the pick. I'm, just, I'm so happy with the pick. Um, it's kind of funny. Uh, the... Uh, during the, the, the watch of the NFC Championship game and the Lions game, and maybe I'm just too overexposed to like the Viking sphere because so much of my like social media feed is Vikings. Uh, but boy, a lot of people went real crazy over a Jamison Williams game that for Jordan Addison would have been the fifth best one of his season. If you just go by front for from scrimmage, which you have to, to be fair to Jamison Williams, because more than half of his yards came on one reverse, uh, which is also like <laughs> a bit of a sustainability thing. Post routes are easier to hit than are easier to score touchdowns on on reverses. I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill. But anyways, again, I'm, I'm getting distracted. OK, so let's talk more X's and O's. Let's let's get into the nitty gritty of like how Jordan Addison played and why it led to that kind of explosiveness, explosiveness, but also that volatility. 
Today's episode of Locked On Vikings is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's online therapy made easy. And let me tell you the way that some of y'all talked about the Lions game. So you guys need therapy. Jesus Christ. If you want to get into it, and um, if you want to uh, get your mental a little bit better, or maybe it's just a maintenance thing, right? Which is totally fine. You can be in a perfectly fine headspace, but I mean, you got to maintain your mental health just like you maintain your physical health. I, I believe in that really, really strongly. But getting into therapy can be a, a tough barrier. Uh, that's why BetterHelp is entirely online. It's flexible to fit your schedule. And if you don't like the therapist that you're linked up with, they'll help you find one and cycle through people until you find somebody that works for you and your needs and your personality and uh, somebody that just like vibes with you. So it can be an enjoyable experience. It's supposed to be an enjoyable experience. Uh, so visit betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off of your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. All right. So Jordan Addison had a very particular style of play, which is being a little guy. <laughs> he's, he's a little guy. A lot of the, the receivers coming out were little guys, which again goes to the draft thing. Like if if you were looking at all of the receivers and you were like, I don't want to draft a little guy. And you just like hardlined that you would have ended up with Quentin Johnston. That would have been the worst option, right? All the little guys did better. You know, they all had that juice and you kind of had to figure out what kind of juice you liked. You know, Zay Flowers had such a different play style than, than Jordan Addison. Addison's a burner, like true and true. He is a burner. And it's interesting because like combine testing wise, it didn't go so well, but there were maybe reasons to believe that that was a little bit funky uh, and, and I think that it turned out that like, I would say, if you look at his testing numbers, they're probably not telling you the right story about Jordan Addison, who uses his speed and the threat of speed really, really, really well. And one of the things you have to do to make sure that that happens is you have to get moving on every single route. It's one of the th those things that, that wide receiver coaches repeat all the time. I'm pretty sure I've heard Keenan McCardell say it in like a video that, that the Vikings produced or something, or maybe I'm just conflating it, but it's, you know, everything's a go. Every single route is a go. And you want to put that stress on the corner where every single route is the threat of being a go route, a deep route. Uh, and whatever it breaks off, you know, everything should kind of look the same before then. But what I really liked about Addison coming out was that you could tell that there was this understanding of, of defensive backs and what they do and don't have to like react to. And sometimes he would be undisciplined about it. He would go outside the parameters of where his route was supposed to be specifically to elicit a certain reaction from that defensive back. But they would like it would work and you would see you could see what he was doing. And it just kind of depends on if your coach is like bugged by that or not, which I think is totally a matter of preference, because I do think it's like sometimes, you go, yeah, you got open, but you took forever. Uh, is like not an option. And I think a lot about the um, the argument. Y'all remember this? It, it was 2018. It was the last week of the season. It was a win and in against the Bears that the Vikings lost. And uh, the there was this like blowout on the sideline between Kirk Cousins and Adam Thielen. In that, what they were arguing about was that Adam Thielen was taking too long to run his routes. He was running them precisely to the right depths and he was doing a lot of, putting a lot of extra wiggle on everything. And a lot of extra, um, I'll, I'll just say bells and whistles, where you know you would you would fake a different thing, you would go, but he it, it, all of that stuff took so long that it would ruin the timing of the play. And and you can kind of see both sides of that argument, where where Adam Thielen says, well, it gets me open, and it's kind of your job to figure out how to get the ball to me once I'm open. And Kirk Cousins saying, yeah, I think you could actually read his lips saying, I don't have 10 seconds. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, manipulate the pocket for that long. I'm not a runaround quarterback. You got to, like, do your route in the time that it's supposed to be. And it was this thing that they had to, like, work out between between each other. And they they worked that out and it wasn't a problem moving forward. But I think about that all the time as, like, this, like, wide receiver discipline thing of, like, yeah, it's it, everybody can put, you know, 10 seconds of wiggle on it. Anybody can, you know, stand there and shimmy forever and take your route all the way out to Timbuktu and come back and you'll eventually get open. But, like, how do you get open and, and generate separation within the parameters of what you're supposed to do? And what I thought was so cool about Addison coming out, and you saw a bunch of this in uh, in, in his tape 
in the season as well was that he could do that. He could he could spatially ruin the parameters of the play. And sometimes he had to do that because otherwise he gets stopped up by bigger, more physical corners. And that's sort of the, the thing that happens. Um, I would say Addison had his worst days against bigger corners and not necessarily against the best corners. Um, I mean, he had a great day against Jair Alexander, who I know Packers fans are like pretty over him. I still respect Jair Alexander as, as one of the better corners, at least in the NFC. And, you know, he got smoked by Jordan Addison in Lambeau in October. He didn't play in the New Year's game, so we didn't really get the rematch there. But like there are good corners and, and Alexander's a physical corner, but finding a way to get him free releases was like part of that game plan. And I think when the Vikings didn't do a good job of getting him free releases and, and the, and the coverage was physical, you could see Addison get ragged on a little bit. And then that timing gets ruined, right? Then that's that same thing where instead of you're just taking too long to run your route because you're putting too much sauce on it, it's um, you're taking too long to run your route because you can't get through the guy. You just physically can't get through the dude. And he's not even like holding you. He's just kind of in your way and disrupting your rhythm. And it costs you, you know, two steps, which is everything. Two steps is forever in a route. You know, that's precise. That's that's timed so precisely. So you kind of lose it that way. And so you you can get these moments where if he can get a free release and he can go outside to where he's supposed to go and he can manipulate a defensive back and say, like, look, I know that when you're in you're in quarters and you're in mod, you know, you're in man outside and deep that you have to to respect outside go balls and you have no choice but to respect outside. You're not reading me. If I threaten go at all, you have to go with it because I know your coverage. So I'm going to lean my stem a little bit more to the outside than the play actually says. Uh, he's really disciplined about some of the like finer details of route running, like, um, on a basic or a dig, you might know it as like a, a deep in, right. Um, you're supposed to carve that and you're, you're supposed to like bubble it, right? That's, that's the best way. The, the worst way to run it is to drift up field. That's begging to, for an interception because DBs can undercut you. Um, the okay way to run it is to just run that thing straight across Yeah, I'm, I'm breaking at 14 yards, right angle. And I run and we're good to go. Nobody will complain about that, but the best way to do it is to actually go upfield at two yards and then come back and then carve that thing back down toward the quarterback. That's really, really hard. A defensive back, if you're already like working your way back toward the quarterback, a D-back is never going to be able to make that play and you're protecting yourself, you're protecting your quarterback. It's a very safe way to do things and you give up like three yards of field position, which on a 15 yard route, like who cares? Um, so it's, it's really, that's, and that's how he runs it. And it's, it's veteran. It's very like advanced. Um, and it's, it's from younger receivers. You'd be perfectly fine if they were just running that straight, but he does a little bit more. So you're not putting a bunch of sauce on it. Like you're not just putting bells and whistles on it. Every decision is very intentional and very thoughtful. And I really love that about his game. I just wish he could get through physical coverage better. And he probably will never be able to get through physical coverage better. I think the Jordan Addison we saw this year is who Jordan Addison is. And it's who we we hoped we were getting with him. So I think this was absolutely a successful draft pick. And for whatever weaknesses that he has, we just live with those now. And that's the bet that we like, that's the that's the bargain that we made. Like that's the that's the purchase that we made in in using a draft asset to acquire a player. You just kind of bought into those problems and you just decided already that you're okay with them. But if the Vikings decide that they're okay with that, the rest is upside, baby. So I'm super happy with it. I'm super into it. Um, I don't, it, it makes wide receiver a, a depth need, you know, a rotational kind of, we need like some guys need, but not necessarily something that the Vikings have to prioritize, which is nice because they've got a lot of other things. So a uh, big thumbs up from this old podcaster. That's, that's what I'll have to say about that. Uh, I will talk to you guys tomorrow. It's, it's a mailbag episode tomorrow, Twitter Tuesday. So get your questions in. You can send them to me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL or at locked on Vikings. Uh, you can send an email to locked on Vikings podcast at gmail.com or put, fill out the Google form in the show notes, uh, YouTube comment will work too. whatever, however you can get it at me, get me a question and I will answer as many of them as I can. I'll see y'all for that. And as always skull.